Good afternoon, everyone. This is Terry Cash with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, also with the center, and we welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University in partnership with the Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of Penn Foster. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, it's a perfect day here in Clemson, South Carolina. Uh, interestingly, the word climate comes to my mind. I wonder why. But I'll tell you one thing. It's a great climate to live in in the month of April. Hey, we're glad to have you all back with us for our program today for solutions to the dropout crisis. Uh, we have many regulars who are joining us, but we especially like to welcome the new listeners to the program. You know, Terry, our program's on a very critical issue of dropout prevention. How can a school become an environment that supports the effective learning of all students and that it engages students in the process at the same time? So um, we're going to look at the resources listed so we can get started with this terrific program right away. I want to tell all our listeners, reminding the old listeners and our new listeners, that we need you to uh, download the PowerPoint that's up there. It's the slideshow. That's going to be used by our presenter to support today's discussion. So have that open and ready. Uh, He's also provided something called the Respect Continuum Model. It's a PDF. And he'll be referring to that during the presentation. So if you have that open and printed out, that will be very helpful as well. I thought the video was really good. It's on their website, and we have a link right to it. It kind of gives you an idea of how students are engaged in this process that we're going to be learning about today. So I hope you've had a chance to see it, but if you hadn't, afterwards you'll, you'll have a good opportunity to look at it then. There are some very useful forms, which are like surveys and self-assessments, and um, these are going to be all for your use after the program today. The websites we have up here, first of all, for Main Street Academics, which uh, is the organization started by our presenter today. You're going to learn all about it as well as the safe measures process. And then we have the National School Climate Center website up there for you. So there's a lot of information, as always, for our listeners as they work towards improving their school climate. Uh, yes, Marty. Uh, once again, it's a great uh, compilation of resources, and today's program is just the first step in learning more about this excellent process. Um, quite honestly, that I've been able to see in action in New Hampshire over the past uh, four to five years, so I'm really excited uh, uh, about today's program. Well, I know you are, and you've told us a lot about it, and that's why we're all here today. Um, And as always, we invite you, the listeners, to be an active part of the program. And so we have two ways you can connect to us. Because we are a radio call-in show, we encourage you to call in your questions and talk with our guests. We have a toll-free number, 888-539-8859. And if you're calling from outside the U.S., the number would be, uh, with your country code, 864-656-4549. You can call now or any time during the program, and we'll have to put you on hold for a few minutes, but we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can during the broadcast. And we also accept email questions, and I know we had a deluge last month of email questions sent to our email address, which is ndpc at clemson.edu, and put the word solutions in the subject line, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as well. So... As always, we're looking forward to engaging with you, our audience, and uh, look forward to those calls and questions today. And our topic this month is on establishing an effective learning environment uh, by establishing a supportive school climate. Joining us today from Concord, New Hampshire, at the studios of the New Hampshire Public Radio is our friend and uh, and colleague, Dr. Bill Preble. Uh, Dr. Preble is a professor of education at New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in educational psychology, curriculum and instruction, educational leadership and reform, and supervises first-year education students and student teachers. Uh, Bill is the founder of the Main Street uh, Academics, an innovative educational research and consulting firm specializing in school climate research and improvement, student leadership development, uh, um, and inspired teaching. Bill is a former elementary school principal, elementary, middle, and high school teacher, and he's currently working on uh, a new book 
uh, entitled Building Respectful Schools Together, Empowering Students and, and Inspiring Teachers to Improve School Climate and Learning. Welcome to the program today, Bill. Thanks very much, Terry. It's great to be here. Um, I just wanted to um, introduce my, one of my students who's here as well, Melissa Gray, um, and she can talk a little bit more about herself in a few minutes, but she's actually a student who's um, uh, been in our program for a few years and actually just uh, ended up coming to New England College and is working with us out in schools now, so she's kind of come full circle. So thanks, Melissa, for joining us. Well, thank you. Um, so I just, I'm just just happy to be here. We, uh, we've been working on school climate issues for around 10 years and uh, started off really doing uh, research on the topic and quickly decided that the information that we were gathering needed to be shared and discussed and uh, kind of quickly turned into a kind of a whole student leadership process. And so we were excited to be here to talk about that. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. And um, for our... Uh Previous uh, listeners and for our new listeners, we recently had a webinar by Gail McGrain from Minnesota pertaining to relationships in which she highlighted the importance of student perceptions on their learning environment. And quite honestly, this program today will drive that discussion even further. Um, As the outside evaluator for New Hampshire's Dropout Prevention Initiative uh, called APEX-2, I saw firsthand uh, the importance of a positive school school climate, uh, on school performance, and the wonderful work uh, of Dr. Preble to engage students in the process and and actually building um, school climate experts. So uh, today's program looks to be a very important one, so let's begin. And be sure to call us with your questions. That number again is toll-free, 888-539-8859. And for those calling outside the U.S., 864 656 4549. Bill, let's turn to the PowerPoint now and learn more about this new perspective that you'll be sharing with us today. Great, thank you. Um, And I will kind of talk through the slides as we go a little bit and try to make it clear when we're changing slides. So if it's a little clunky that way, please forgive me. But um, the title of this session, uh, School Climate Through Students' Eyes, actually was a title of an article that we did in Ed Leadership uh, last January. And it sort of sums up the point is that, you know, we're really interested in looking at the whole notion of various perceptions about school safety, respect, um, bullying and harassment, engaged learning, all those things that I think make a school either work well or not. Um, so school climate through students' eyes is actually kind of the, the, the theme for this whole, this whole piece. Um, if we switch to the next um, slide. Oops, mine's not switching. <laughs> Um, there's a quote here by Jerome uh, Freiberg, which we really like, and it really helps us to uh, kind of move move the d- discussion quickly to the importance of school climate. Uh, we, s- we think that school climate is kind of like the air that we breathe. Uh, you don't really notice it until it becomes toxic. Um, I, I, I think that just kind of sums up what we learned as we've been out in the schools talking to individual students. Um, there are a whole bunch of folks in schools that when you walk in the door and ask them about the climate of their school, they... They say it's great, um, and, and there's a lot of success going on in our schools, and we don't want to minimize that. But we're very interested in looking at the kind of different effects of school climate on different people. Uh, whenever we collect data, we disaggregate the data and look at different populations, gender differences, racial differences. And, and actually, we'll come back to this, but one of the biggest differences in the school climate that we found through our research is the difference between uh, students who say that they're going on to college and kids who may not feel that college is part of their future. Uh, they have very, very different experiences and perceptions of school climate. Um, we believe that the um, the emphasis over the last several years now on um, really um, pushing schools to improve academic performance has been a good thing in many ways, but it also has been uh, something that has had a negative impact on school climate in many schools. Um, everybody points to the cancellation of recess in elementary schools or the cancellation of art or music, um, PE, uh, in favor of more reading, writing, and arithmetic. And uh, we know that there are kids who just thrive on those other kinds of interests, and school becomes a different place when we remove those things. Um, if we flip to the to the next page, uh, the next slide, there's um, 
there's a little silly little uh, metaphor that we like to use, but my colleagues give me a hard time about this one. But um, the, the one thing that we have heard over and over and over again as we go to schools is they talk about the fact that school climate is, is what happens when grown-ups aren't around. Mm-hmm. And I thought as a definition of school climate, um, thinking about the idea that there are um, perceptions of school climate that um, are apparent to adults – but then there are other things that uh, students see or parents see or teachers aides see happening in a school routinely that may be kind of under the surface in a school. And that's one of the reasons that we've put this program and this process in place is to expose the whole picture. So we really want to kind of zero in on the, the goals of our session for today. Um, we want to talk about what school climate is and why it matters. Uh, we want to provide kind of a national uh, perspective. Uh, there, are, there are some exciting uh, developments in this area that we want to talk about. Uh, there are a set of school climate standards that are being proposed, and we've actually uh, realigned our surveys uh, to reflect those new standards, and we're very excited about how much more depth they've added to the conversation, the work of Jonathan Cohen and Terry Pickerel and the National School Climate Council. Um, We want to share with you what Marty said, this process that we've been using called Safe Measures. And it's a pretty simple model, uh, except one thing I think is very special about it, and that is that we we really utilize the students as experts on school climate. It's not like we go into schools and try to, uh, you know, impose adult or expert solutions. Uh, Students who really live and die school every day are, are the true experts on school, and we try to kind of capture their voices as part of this. Um, so we'll talk about the importance of student leadership and empowerment. Um, again, I refer to the national movement. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with this piece looking at the direction that the country's headed in terms of addressing school climate. And we'd like to make sure we have plenty of que- time for questions. Um, so the next slide, where it's really the definition piece. And um, this is kind of a standard definition of school climate uh, proposed by the National School Climate Council. It says a school climate refers to the character and the quality of school life, and that's pretty broad and all-encompassing. You can see, you know, that they talk really about some specific elements. When we first started assessing school climate, we started measuring um, perceptions of school safety, physical and emotional safety. A lot of the early school climate work came out of um, the shootings at Columbine and the the research that was done following that that showed that school climate has been a major factor in in school violence uh, whenever it happens, so we can't ignore it. Um, Or if we do ignore it, we ignore it to our peril. Um, But peer respect, uh, peer-to-peer relationships and uh, belonging of certain groups of kids inside of a school, um, a lot of the bullying work, the anti-bullying work that's out there deals with the peer rejection and uh, harassment of certain kinds of students in a school, and that, that all contributes to school climate. The other issue that is a little bit more controversial when it comes to going into schools is talking about the perceptions that exist in the school about adult student respect and the relationships that occur in schools between adults and, and students. Um, it's It's wonderful for us to look at those issues of adult-student relations and respect by looking at our survey data when we see huge gaps in what the adults say is happening in terms of relations and respect as opposed to what students say is happening. And it causes a lot of conversation, and that's the whole point of the data collection is to really have um, information in front of you that may cause you to rethink your position. And so we'll talk more about how we collect that data. So Looking at safety, looking at um, peer respect issues, and looking at teacher and student respect and relationship issues is really what we, we think of when we think about school climate. Um, sometimes um, numbers and t- talking about sort of research, is it, it sort of gets a little, a little boring. <laughs> um, so what we've done is we've tried to highlight the importance of words in the work that we do. And if you flip to the next slide, Um, we've listed a a few words here and I'm going to ask Melissa to pick a couple that she thinks that in her work school climate has really kind of uh, represented these kinds of issues. You want to just say a couple of those words out loud? Let's listen to them carefully. Respect. Adults who listen. Relationships with friends and teachers. And feeling like you belong. What we try to do is to um, 
take the words of students and the words of teachers and we, we ask open-ended questions as well as survey questions to have people describe their climate of their school and we get these really powerful quotes in the process and when we go into the specific stages of our collaborative action research process we'll talk about how we use the quotes but this is a little example um, of how sometimes just stopping and listening to the words of others about the way that they feel in their school is a, is a powerful motivator to get people to take the issue seriously. Uh, I think in the past, issues of school climate has been kind of the touchy-feely subject or the, the soft subject rather than, you know, academic performance or academic achievement. And what we see in all of the research on effective schools is that the two come together, that there's a direct relationship between school climate and learning. Uh, you can't have effective schools without a positive school climate, we don't believe. So it isn't about, oh, the hard, the hard issues versus the soft issues. It's they, they belong together. Um, another, another key piece, I think, is just really kind of touching on the research. And we're not going to have time to go over a whole lot of this, but on the, sli- the next slide where it says school climate matters, we've tried to kind of just summarize some of the key findings that guide our work and that we try to help schools understand. Um, I referred to the idea that the Justice Department, um, when the initial sc- uh, school shootings uh, happened and have continued, uh, when they do their investigations, they find uh, Secret Service and Justice Department that school climate is, is caught up in all of the major sc- uh, school violence issues that have occurred. And we just can't ignore that. Um, if we're interested in school violence, we have to talk about the, the whole issue of climate. And I think also, Bill, what's coming along in the news more and more now is uh, teen suicides related yep. to school climate climate issues, would this also be uh, clustered with this kind of research? Absolutely. And mm-hmm. certainly, you know, the state of Massachusetts has just uh, yeah. had a wake-up call big yeah. time in Hadley and South Hadley. And um, we've been getting calls from lots of people about, you know, how can we be more proactive about getting out in front of those kinds of issues and um, the, the community taking on those issues in a proactive way before we have those kinds of tragic situations is critical. Um, we need to have those conversations about cruelty and about um, respect and what respect actually means. Mm-hmm. And we're going to use this respect continuum in a few minutes to show what, what our research, research on respect has shown. Um, the other part, I think, is really important for school leaders. Um, I just c- cited this one c- piece of research on the brain uh, and downshifting that yeah. we know that if we expect students to use their minds well and uh, you know think clearly and, and get ex- excited and engaged in learning, they can't do that if they're fearful. <laughs> they can't. Their brains actually kind of shift into a different place of survival, and uh, the whole notion of higher order thinking is actually impossible when uh, when you're under threat or under great stress in school. So. Uh, we just have to address these issues of emotional and, and physical safety as part of our work, or we can't expect kids to learn in an optimal way. Um, again, th- you can look more uh, deeply at those, but one of our most recent uh, kinds of analysis of our data, uh, hundreds of schools around the country, we sort of dumped them all together in a big pile and looked at, we looked at the numbers. And about one out of five elementary school students in the hundreds of elementary schools that we've been in report feeling unsafe in school. So 20% of our kids right now are, are facing that, that challenge of being able to focus on school. Uh, I would imagine that those, those numbers are higher at the middle school and the high school level as well. We're, mm-hmm. we're just looking at yeah. those other data. So this is not an isolated you know, project, pro- problem. It's a problem that's affecting a lot of kids, and I think it's really worth the time and attention. If we're serious about learning, we can't ignore these issues. Um, let's flip to uh, the, other, the next piece, because I, I kind of want to mm-hmm. leave plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Um, this is um, the idea that there are national school climate standards. And um, Jonathan Cohen uh, is... Um, a wonderful person who has, has spent quite a bit of time in the last year or so trying to boil down what should every school in the United States be thinking about as they work to address school climate issues. I had the privilege of working with uh, Terry Pickrell and, and Jonathan over the summer um, trying to really look at these standards through the lens of educational equity and, and making sure that if we have national standards, they're, they're standards that actually help the most challenged kids or the most at-risk kids uh, and that they're, they're really a useful tool. So what they've come up with, and I'll, I'll just um, actually going to bring Melissa in here a little bit because instead of just talking sort of about these pieces, I want her to give some examples of how it kind of plays out. Um, the first standard is just schools that need – basically schools need to collect data on these issues and look at the data and develop some sort of a plan. 
And Melissa's school was a school that actually did that with us. So you, you collected data from your peers, from your teachers. Um, in some schools, they collect data from parents. They look at that. They decide what the issues are and create a plan. So we think that's the bare minimum. The other part is that schools have to then look at the kind of policies and practices, the sort of systems pieces that are in place. Most of the schools we go into, uh, issues of you know, student confidence about discipline comes up or the rules aren't clear and people feel that the rules are enforced in unequal ways perhaps and that causes a lot of tension. Why don't you talk, Melissa, about one of the many little projects that we'll have you talk about. But let's, let's talk about your, your project around the rules and how you guys tackled that issue with a handbook. Well, we had a lot of problems with the rules and the rule book. And we what we did was we had a committee that went through it and found a lot of that a lot of the rules contradicted each other. So, what we would do was a few of us sat down and we picked out all the things that don't make sense or like or are completely wrong and we took it to first the faculty then the school board and they saw that we were right and we they changed most of what we had to say so the idea that uh, any school that wants to address school climate needs to look at their policies and procedures and the structures and systems in place, I just like the idea that the student leadership team um, at your school decided to take on that standard and use this handbook as kind of the beginning point. And um, one of the things that we try to teach them is how, you know, to how to be a leader. And one of the things they have to realize is they have to learn about the system and work their way through. So I, I love the idea that you got permission from the principal to work on this issue. You got uh, a t- you know, some time in front of the faculty to share your thoughts and to kind of brainstorm with them and then took it right to the school board. How did the school board receive your recommendations? Were they enthusiastic about this? Were they defensive? How did that work? They saw that they were wrong and they they reali- they were good about it. Yeah. It was It was fairly easy to be in front of them and they understood that they were wrong, so they fixed what needed to be fixed. Nice. So. And, and I guess I'll just take that idea of you know, what, being wrong. One of the things that we really do try to do when we start this process in a school, and again, this is something that Jonathan Cohen talks about in his work around the country on school climate, is to try to create kind of a no-fault uh, paradigm, a no-blame no approach to these things. And so my guess is you didn't go to the school board and say, hi, guys, you're wrong. We're no, right. But you, not at all. You said, you said, you know, there are some problems with this handbook. We are, we're offering some solutions. Can we work together to fix it? And yep. I think that, that spirit is really the right one for students and, and, and teachers. And sometimes the schools spend a lot of time blaming and pointing fingers. And if we can just cut to the chase and say, let's not waste our time with the blaming piece. Let's just look at the data, look at the issues, and, and try to work on them. Another piece that's really critical to this, and you'll see as we go on, um, this notion that school climate is very much tied up in school uh, teaching and learning practices. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I talk about the respect continuum, I think you'll see that there are two approaches that schools can take to this, uh, improving school climate. They can either try to kind of crush the disrespect in a school, get rid of bullying, get rid of school violence, get rid of disrespectful behavior, or they can say that, you know, while we have to work on those issues, maybe the best use of our time is to look at how do we build respect into the everyday lives of the teachers and the students. And the best way to do that is through teaching, that students and teachers spend most of their time, you know, kind of working in the classroom together. And the ways that teachers model respect for learning differences or respect for individual differences and uh, willingness to allow students to become engaged in making choices and decisions about their own learning, that dramatically shifts the climate of a school. And we're going to talk more about the teaching and learning pieces. Um, Number four, another uh, another thing that happened in your school was where you really tackled that standard for and de- developing a welcoming environment. Could you tell us a little bit about what you guys did with that? Well, to, one of the littler projects we did to make a more welcoming environment was we decided that we would paint all of our bathrooms. That was something we did to just try to make the school look better. But the other thing we did to try to welcome the freshmen in more was we took what used to be called Step Up Day and we turned it into a more welcoming orientation day where there was probably six or seven of us that we all made yellow t-shirts and we took the freshmen in the day before school and we showed them all the teachers. We did icebreakers with them. 
we had the gentleman from the ropes course come and do team building activities and it was much better than just throwing them in with all the seniors and everyone that because that's how they used to do it so and um at the end of this we'll talk a little bit more about some of the best practices that that we've seen in the schools and that we've seen the research support um I know that you guys got the idea about the step-up day from the Woodsville uh, yeah. presentation that the s- students in Woodsville, New Hampshire did at a student leadership retreat. And what the Woodsville students did to create a welcome environment was they literally got together and said to the principal, if you really want us to improve the discipline numbers in our school, it was really the freshmen were having all the suspensions and the problems with discipline. Uh, we need to really do more with the transitioning of the students from six towns that were coming into oh, that wow. regional high yeah. school. And and to to basically spend some time over the summer and into the beginning of school working on transitions. And what was so cool about that was they said to the principal, we need a budget, small budget. And they hand-delivered backpacks, custom-made backpacks to each freshman over the summer, a student leadership team member. And they contained the handbook that the students had worked on and uh, guidelines for survival of freshmen and, and, and did the same thing as you guys did in terms of welcoming them in with a kind of beginning of school event. But, but the idea that the principal would turn over the whole process of welcoming students to the school, you know, to the students, was a, a kind of an act, I think, of, of trust that he, that, he, that he put into the students. And we know that um, the discipline numbers uh, in that system plummeted. Uh, the problems that they had with their freshman class really went away as a result of the work that the students led. So it's, it's pretty amazing how when you empower the students to take some of these climate issues on, they can have a pretty dramatic effect. Well, I've just got to and, interject here, Bill, because yeah. I love this idea, and I wanted to reinforce it for a couple of reasons. One, because of the student role, but two, because we're seeing in schools across the country that the transition to high school or to middle school is so difficult and really has an impact on the dropout rate. So, Melissa, this is a big thing you did, um, and I congratulate you for doing that, and I hope it continues in that school because this is a powerful dropout prevention strategy as well as a school climate issue. It is, and I think I think the tone that Melissa and her and her teammates set with the adults, uh, having the adults just listen more, um, listen more to the to the students, and not to plan in isolation of the students, but to plan collaboratively with the students about strategies like this is is wonderful. And and I know that 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 has been left behind now that you've graduated. Yeah, I mean, I just graduated last year, but I know for a fact that they did it again this year because I still have friends back there. So, and so and, and at Melissa, least we left that behind. Yeah. And Melissa is an expert on sustainability of the process, and we're going to talk a little bit ah, more about some of the challenges right. of sustaining it when we go. Okay. But I guess. That just leads me to the last standard, which to me we've just kind of you know highlighted ourselves here, is that a school that really wants to improve school climate has to build civic responsibility and civic engagement among all the members of the community, that everybody has to step up and take responsibility for making the place work. And it's not some committee or it's not a team of adults or just the principal. And so just allowing students to take on these leadership roles is providing opportunities for civic engagement. In some of the schools that we work in, they actually can earn civics credit by being members of the student leadership team as part of an extended learning opportunity. So that's been very exciting. And the last piece is, and this is the part I think that really does motivate a lot of the students on the team, um, is that they're really working for social justice here. They're working to ensure that every student has a fair shake. And in the work that we've done in some states where there's pretty profound racist problems in the school, um, the, the issues that the student leadership teams take on are issues that adults haven't been very successful in dealing with. But when peers come together of different racial groups and fight for social justice within the school system, uh, providing equal opportunities for all types of learners, etc., uh, it becomes a really powerful, powerful motivation for staying engaged in the process. So we like the school climate standards as a way to kind of focus attention, and we collect data on all five of those as part of the process. So there's lots to talk about. You know, Bill, so we got a question come in on the email, which maybe this is a good point to, to insert it. And it's um, Vervia, and she asked, do you have a school climate survey we could use. Is there, is there anything on the resources that um, would lead her to that? Um, certainly, if she comes to our website, uh, we have what we call kind of a, um, a snapshot survey that we put up that takes sample questions from each of those, um, each of those different categories, each of those five standards. Um, 
we we actually feel really, really strongly, though, about the process. Um, my concern and one of the reasons we don't just give the survey out to schools is mm-hmm. that we really believe that it is the process of engaging the students and maybe we can actually turn to that mm-hmm. next. Um, yeah. it, because I just – I have to tell you, I was a middle school teacher for years. I taught seventh grade social studies. Uh-huh. I saw my students taking the surveys all the time mm-hmm. and, man, did they goof on them. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know, if Melissa. I don't know if Melissa had experience with kids taking surveys, but yeah, I feel as though if we just had the survey to take, it wouldn't have had the same effect as if we, like, when we did the process. You know what I mean? So the idea, and and maybe we can turn to that now, is the role. If we go back to the standards and talk about empowerment of the students and civic engagement as one of the goals, we go into a school and we actually train the student leadership team that we organize uh, as the researchers. And when they go into classrooms and explain the survey and explain what the point is, promise to bring the data back to the students and, and be, are assured themselves that they'll get to work with the data, we get a completely different level of engagement of the students in the, in the data collection process. So if we flip to the next page, which says a glimpse at the work we do, we're kind of into that, that we bring, we start by bringing adult leaders together. And I can refer you, if you'd like to, one of the handouts um, there's one of the handouts that says um, student-led action research process, safe mm-hmm. measures. Okay. Um, it's outlined there, stage one, stage two, up through stage five. And it's, a, it's actually a very simple kind of standard action research model. But the thing that's different about it is that we really lead with students. And so we start by bringing a team of adults. You, know, you have to have the principal on board. And Melissa is going to talk a little bit about the importance of the principal in this whole process. That, that believe in student empowerment, that are willing to actually listen. And we actually ask that question first before we even start because the worst thing we could do is get this, this kind of empowerment model in place and then have the adults choose to ignore what the students have to say. It's a setup. So we really get the buy-in from the leaders at first. Mm-hmm. Um, we <clears throat> make sure that we, we have a real long conversation about what is an effective student leadership team to work on school climate issues. And it's very different than student government or student council. Um, Liz, could you talk a little bit about the selection of students and just, you know, the, the notion of having a broadly representative, diverse team? Was that something that your school tried to do? Yeah, they picked a lot of different types of people. In my school, we didn't have that much of diversity because, I mean, we are from a small town. But there were kids that weren't leaders and some kids that were. And I was one of the ones that wasn't a leader. So it was nice to be able to be involved with something that I normally wouldn't have even wanted to do or tried to do. So selecting a diverse team is one of actually the hardest jobs we have because when you use the word leader, a certain kind of student emerges in your thinking. So what we've done is we've actually put a process together where we talk about not selecting student leaders but selecting experts. And the way we get experts is we say, why don't you adults that are working on our little design team here, maybe four or five teachers and a principal, why don't you go in the cafeteria if it's a middle or high school and look at the tables and look at who's sitting at what tables. Think about which students are kind of willing to talk a little bit, willing to engage, and go pick one of those students from each table and that's your student leadership team. They're experts on their lunch table group. So we all know that kids sit by, you know, ethnic groups, cultural groups, academic groups, athletic, non-athletic groups, and that way it ensures that we get a really diverse team. And if you think about it, the notion of selecting a diverse team, doing the team building exercises that you talked about, if we can get the student leadership team who is a real diverse group to get together, work together, solve problems together, that's actually kind of a microcosm of what our overarching goal is. We want, we want to do it with you know, a handful of 10 or 15 students first to prove that these kids can actually kind of hang out together and collaborate and work together. So there's a real rationale there. And then those students are the ones that go into the classrooms and ask students to complete the survey. So measuring and evaluating is, is the second stage. Um, and I think um, it would be good for us to flip a couple slides here to the one that says how the safe measures process works. And so we just talked about stage one where we have the adult team get together, do a plan, commit to empowering of kids, uh, selecting a student leadership team that's representative. The students then take this online survey. They uh, have set up a schedule. Um, how many days did it take you to do your survey in your school? One, two? I'm pretty sure it took like 
most of us did it the one day, and then if people weren't here, they did it the second yeah. day. I honestly don't remember. Yeah, it takes it takes literally depending on the size of school, you know, fifteen minutes per class. Ours wasn't very big. In, so. in and out of <laughs> in and out of the uh, computer lab, every every group gets an introduction by the student leaders. They look up there, and there's you know a very diverse group of three kids explaining what the survey is. So stage two is really important: engaging the students and collecting the data. Stage three is getting the student leaders to sit down and look at the data. And we bring the data back to the principal first to make sure that there's nothing crazy in there and super controversial. Um, But then we bring the results to the student leadership team. They interpret the results. They set three goals for improvement. And they bring um, the data then to the faculty. And that's a really important part of the process because, to tell you the truth, a lot of times the faculty's perception of school climate is very, very different than the students, which I'm sure you're not you know, surprised about. Um, but when, when the faculty, I'll give you a quick example, if 100% of the faculty say that I adjust my teaching depending upon my students' needs and interests, that whole idea of kind of differentiation mm-hmm. of instruction, yeah. 100% of the faculty say I do that. And then you look at the student data right next to that and maybe like 35 or 40% of the kids say my teachers adjust their teaching depending upon my needs and interests. There's some real opportunities for a conversation there. So. And, and it, it can be, you know, sometimes people can get a little freaked out about that information. But what we encourage them to do is look at the patterns in the data. Look, at, look across different questions and see if you see the same type of thing. So really causing the school to kind of wrestle with what is true about our school is kind of one of the most important pieces here. And once they decide on three goals that they want to work on, now we're ready to create a really good action plan. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have um, a little more conversation about the, kind, the ways that we help them do their action planning. Um, the last thing that we make sure that we do is we kind of keep score as we go along. As they do action projects over the course of the year, we try to collect snapshots of how effective are those strategies so that we're not just doing, you know, one or two things and waiting a year to collect post-test data. But we do collect data again about a year later, and we compare. And I'll show you some of those changes that schools have made over the time. Uh, Bill, um, yep. tell me about this uh, from stage one to, say, stage four, stage five. What's, uh, what sort of time frame are you looking at with regard to implementing this? We typically, if we can get started with a little bit of planning during the summer or actually if like the, you know, this time of year just to kind of get the adult team organized and have them commit to doing the work, which usually happens. You know, we usually, schools usually decide they want to do this for the coming year. We can have action plans developed <coughs> and implementation started by Christmas. And that gives them the whole second half of the year to really implement their projects. Mm-hmm. We encourage them to implement the projects and continue to work to refine things over the course of the next year and then do a post-test at the, sec- at the end of the second year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we just think that it takes time. It takes a lot of little steps. Um, you know, what, what Melissa talked about in terms of, like, building teamwork among the leadership team and getting the adults to partner with the students and trying out small things like painting the bathrooms, which was quite an adventure at your school, all the way to, you know, really working to change discipline, policies, and procedures. So we encourage in their action plan, Terry, to do a... Um, to do a, a, a short-term set of goals, a sort of medium-term set of goals, and a longer-term set of goals. And after two years, they can usually hit those three. Well, that, that also suggests that there's some uh, pretty serious staff development going on with, with students. <laughs> and who's, yeah. uh, who is doing that? Who is actually? Again, depending upon the kinds of goals that the school choose to work on, <clears throat> um, we try to – the biggest thing we really try to do is to make this not an add-on. And I think you saw that in the work that we did in the dropout prevention uh, network, the APEX network. We, we really try to tie into existing staff development time so that there's not sort of extra things on school climate, but that the, the people who are making decisions about what kind of training do we need related to our goals, related to our data, is just built into the normal school improvement planning process. So the more this is not a, la- a set of new layers or a set of new committees – but it's embedded in the work of the school to just continue to collect data and reflect on itself and improve. That's been the most effective. In Tennessee, what we've been able to do in those schools is to build this right into the Tennessee school improvement planning process. So they're looking at their academic performance data alongside their school, their school climate data as they do their strategic planning for school improvement. So it's not an extra step at all. Um, 
I do think that it might be good to, we've talked a lot about the student leadership team and that we see students as the experts. And uh, the only other thing that I would add about that is faculty are exhausted and there's just, there's just so much going on in schools. I mean, I was a seventh grade teacher for years and a high school teacher. And, uh, you know, the idea that people from the outside would come into our schools and tell us what to do was not very appealing. Um, so the more they own these goals and they own these projects and they're really kind of things that they choose to work on, the better. But I think that when adults and students work together to do school improvement, some pretty magical things happen, really. And and I think it brings out the best in the teachers. Um, I, I don't know, Terry, if you're, you know, we want to talk about this, but I was so encouraged when you did your uh, analysis of the Apex Project and came back and said that you felt that in the schools that had uh, student leadership teams, that the adults in those schools tended to persist more in their implementation of their of their change projects. They, and I, I always envisioned the student <laughs> leaders like Melissa going up and, you know, knocking on the door going, I thought you said we were going to meet. <laughs> I thought you said we were going to keep working on these things when teachers can easily get distracted and kind of move away from the commitments they make. So I, I love the idea that the student leadership team can actually help schools sustain their school improvement initiatives. And that, that's kind of what I read in your report. Well, even more so, I, I, I think the language that I use that the student leadership actually, quite honestly, had driven uh, um, yes. it, it quite had it, it driven the reform, and uh, and there was some really solid data to support uh, the outcomes that we you know we'd seen directly attributed to uh, student engagement. So I think you know we've kind of made a good case for why have students at the table, and there's a couple slides here that I, I don't think we need to go over anymore. Um, uh, I, I think that idea of you know collecting the kind of the collective knowledge of a diverse group of students to talk about school improvement. And I will tell you this one quick story about the value of this. In Tennessee, we, <clears throat> we've started this work in 36 schools. Um, that, that Ed Leadership article uh, that I referred to at the beginning was about the work we've done in Tennessee. We're on our eighth year there. This is probably the last year we've trained everybody. They're able to sustain this without us. And, uh, but it's a 36-school project, so it's, it's been pretty, pretty intense. They started this work because of pervasive racial discrimination in, in some of their high schools. Um, there actually were mock lynchings in the high schools that adults mm-hmm. weren't aware of. Um, very scary. Uh, they became the focus of a uh, peer-on-peer uh, civil rights case. And um, we were sent in initially just to evaluate school climate to see if they could you know, kind of get a, get a handle on it. Mm-hmm. But as soon as people started looking at the data, they realized that, you know, the data itself was not just something to use in a kind of summative way. It was a tool. And so they began to look at it and develop their plans. Um, I, I guess what I, what I was really excited about in, in, in Sullivan County was the commitment that they made to um, bringing together students over time, now they have essentially um, made it systemic. They have a student leadership process in all their schools, elementary, middle, and high school, called the Respect, uh, their, the R&L teams, the Respect and Leadership teams. And, and there's an adult who re- receives a stipend to coordinate that in the 36 schools. So they've really adopted the school climate data to be collected on a regular basis, and they've adopted the notion of student leadership as a part of their systemic approach to continuing to kind of keep their eye on the prize. So I thought that was very exciting. Um, if we can turn to this next slide, and I'll see if I can bring it up here. Sorry. Um, oops. It says um, our data. Um, so you can get a feel that we go into a school, we recruit these kids, we have them do surveys. And on the survey, there's some open-ended questions. It says, tell us you know, whatever stories you want about school climate. Um, I would like to show you the power of the words. Melissa, would you be willing to just pick a couple of these? And this is really what we do. When we get the data back, we have our student leadership team meeting. As the kids walk in, we say, words or numbers? <laughs> which, which do you like? Do you like to work with words or do you like to work with numbers? And they pretty much split right in half. And so the kids that work with words get a whole pile of these quotes and they go through and they pick out three or four quotes each that they feel that their teachers need to hear that represent the voice of the students that they, they think are the most important. Mm-hmm. So we have the students actually read these as if it's them speaking these words to the faculty as a way to get the faculty to kind of pay attention. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I would make this school more open to different beliefs and points of views. I think teachers should provide different ways to learn and test. 
I think the students should have a say in how we learn and what we want to learn. And there are way too many drug dealers here. When we got checked, 48 people got suspended. I mean, really? Again, I think, you know, to show people sets of numbers is one thing. But to have a group of 10 students stand up there, step forward one step and read a quote and step back and the next person steps up, it's kind of a qualitative punch in the nose. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it gives, it gives the teachers a real sense of what the students are seeing um, and how they perceive the issues in the school. School climate is about perception, and that it's a pretty nice way to look at it because essentially we all admit that you know f- none of us see things the same way, so why would we expect to see school climate the same way? And it's a matter of then looking at the patterns in the data. So we turn then to the next piece, which is the quantitative data. And I guess I'd use this one slide here. Uh, students are willing to step forward and help others um, when they see others getting picked on or harassed. Um, This is a school that did this um, data collection over a three-year period, 2003 to 2007, a four-year period, excuse me. And if you're looking at the the, the slide, you can see we always talk about climbing the stairs, (laughs) Um, that it's pretty evident that this school has been sort of making progress on this issue among all of the different groups. except for their diverse group. And I will tell you that there's a very small number in that diverse group, so th- those, those statistics are a little suspect. But the bottom line here is that the school decided that they were going to focus on helping students learn how to take care of uh, school climate issues and, and empowering them to be part of the solution, and they're getting there. They're not done yet, uh, you know, but they feel a lot better about where they are now than they did when they started. And it's just a growth model. It's just you just keep moving forward, keep climbing those steps. Um, another um, another slide that, again, we try to show this information to the faculty and get them to say, you know, what do you see in here? Uh, this one is, I feel physically safe being who I am at this school. And if you notice here that there are um, nice gains, if you look across the, the, the four-year period, um, except males seem to uh, have kind of gone up and come back down again. Females have made tremendous strides in this school towards physical safety, and, and that's been, that was really one of, the, one of the main issues. They were one of the lowest groups when we started. So it, one of the things we talk about is the whole notion of efficacy, teacher efficacy, and we actually measure that as part of our survey. The extent to which teachers feel like they are in control of the outcome, that, they, that what they do matters. And there's a lot of folks who feel like, oh, this is, you know, kids being kids or this is, you know, stuff that's beyond my control. This is about, you know, racial issues or family issues or, you know, bigger, bigger stuff than me. And there's not much I can do about it. When we are able to come back year after year and show them the progress that they're making, it inspires them to continue to work hard on the issue and it gives them actually some confidence in themselves as educators. And so the hidden agenda here is not to change kids. It's to change teachers' personal sense of kind of professional efficacy, that the things they do in school matters, that they can take control of their school, and by working in partnership with kids, they're much more effective. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, thing when you hear teachers talk about that. And I guess I want to come back to your story about your own involvement in this. Um, you and I hadn't seen each other for a while, right? Right. <laughs> can you just talk about the history of how you got here today very, very quickly? Well, we, um, with our student leadership team, five of us, I'm pretty sure it was like five, got chosen to come to the uh, leadership summit or retreat. Teen whatever, summit. Yep. Whatever you want to call it. Yep. Um, and it happened to be at New England College. And I went there and I absolutely loved it because it was a small school like I was from. So I decided to go there and... In one of my classes I'm taking right now, we had to do, well, we have to do a project where we go out and work with a group. And I just, I saw that this was on the list and I immediately wanted to work with it because I, that's why I wanted to come here was to continue working with them after I got out of high school. So. And so um, I actually didn't know you. I was on sabbatical when you when you came. I didn't know she came to New England College. We worked together up in Col- Colebrook, and I get a call that um, she's doing a project for a course that uh, a, a colleague of mine is teaching. And and lo and behold, uh, 
Melissa comes walking through my door and she's ready to go out and help schools. And that, what, two, two days later, we went out and we visited two different schools and she got to tell her story about, about what she needed. Let's talk very quickly about that. You, you had kind of not a real happy ending to your work on this. You started off with your principal calling us, wanted to do this work. She was excited about it, got you guys together. But talk about sort of the whole notion of what what was missing by the time you finished up there. You worked on it for a couple years though, right? Yeah, we had it for, it was probably a year and a half at yeah. least. And um, the principal that started it with us ended up leaving. So it was very hard for us when the person who got it going for us left and we didn't really and the per, another person that um was one of our advisors I'd say she also left so all the faculty that we had that was really on board with us wasn't there anymore so it was hard for us to keep going and we ended up kind of ending the group I mean it doesn't I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist anymore yeah. so and so what happened, we talked about the importance of the principal mm-hmm. to be uh, an advocate for student leadership and student empowerment, and that principal left. And, you know, no fault of the new principal, but it wasn't her thing no, when she came in. No, it wasn't her fault at all. Yeah. Um, the teacher who plays the role of kind of the mentor or the advisor to the student leadership team, um, that role is critical. The success, and we've done research on this now in, in probably 40 or 50 schools where we've looked at the role of the adult advisor or the adult mentor to mm-hmm. the student team. And um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the teacher that you worked with initially and how she worked with you guys that got this thing going. She was one of the only ones that was willing to sit there and do meetings with us and actually listen to what we wanted to do because she was also new at our school. So she could see what was going on, like from our point of view, too, because she's just coming into it. And um, so she was she was empathetic to the work that you were doing. She was supportive. She gave her time to it. Did she tell you guys what to do, or did she... Did no, she, sort she of, would give us suggestions of stuff yeah. we could do, but she never told us we had to do um, certain things. And, and so I think that really sums up, I think, the importance of the uh, leader in the school and the importance of having an adult mentor that understands how to be a kind of guide on the side right. rather than be kind of a person dictating, oh, I've got a team now to do all my work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, I, I guess I want to just do one more slide here. Um, this is students uh, feel safe at school. Um, I feel physically safe being who I am at school, and we did have a, a, a tremendous um, rise in that from, from the point of view of the girls in this school. But notice the other plans, um, the students who were not college-bound in this school. And, Terry, this, I think, gets back to the whole dropout issue. Um, that really the kids who don't see a clear path uh, after high school, the students who really aren't you know, there to kind of prepare themselves for some, something that's predictable, uh, have a harder time. They're floating a little bit. Um, a story that I actually started to tell a little bit ago was this principal who was down in Sullivan County who, when we first brought the data, we showed him data on uh, his school climate, and he turned so red. I, the poor guy thought he was going to explode. Um, David w- was his name. And he, he just was so angry because he said, Bill, this isn't my school. I've been a principal here for 30 years, and I know my kids, and I know my school, and this is not my school. And I said, David, flip the page. Flip the page. Look at the next page. He looked at the next page, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's my school. And I said, David, that's the data on your college-bound kids. <laughs> and the school that he had in his mind, the kind of mental model he had of his school, was the experience of his, his best and brightest kids, his most successful kids. And that's what he was creating as a principal, and he was proud of it. Mm-hmm. He was shocked when he saw that the experience of a whole bunch of the kids in his school that were not those kinds of kids was incredibly different than that. I will tell you that you know we worked in that district. David actually retired two years ago. But he became probably the chief advocate for this process in Sullivan County, Tennessee, because he saw that there was a blind spot that he had as an administrator. He wasn't seeing all of the sort of picture. And he embraced this data as as kind of an education for himself and was a champion for for the work in his school and a lot of the other schools in the district. So I I love the idea of using the data just to kind of generate dialogue about um, how do we make sure that we're kind of aware of what's going on. Um, so I, I don't know that, uh, 
we'll do maybe one more of these slides very quickly. And how are we doing for time? Well, what I, what I was going to say is I was going to um, offer the phone number again as a last yes. chance for people to call now that we've been hearing everything. But I do know you have some wonderful um, examples and stories to tell to the end. And we're doing fine for time. The joys of being on the web are we don't have anybody giving us the hook at 430. We can keep... Uh, sharing good stories till uh, we're done. But I will tell our listeners, if you do want to have an opportunity to talk to Bill or Melissa right now, the toll-free number is 888-539-8859. And, of course, if you are more interested in uh, being uh, just a quick answer, the Internet is good for some of those kinds of questions as well. And that is ndpc at clemson.edu and put solutions in the subject line. So we we do welcome your participation, but we do have some wonderful uh, stories coming up. So um, let's move forward, Bill. Well, I'll actually combine this um, statistical data with a story about how we began to do research on this topic. Okay. Um, This slide um, says more students uh, feel the teachers know and respect them. And uh, I was saying that we're, we're just kind of doing this analysis of our data over the last 10 years with UMass. And what was really exciting, and this was literally an hour before I came here, uh, we saw that of all of the effects of this work in hundreds of schools around the country, the greatest effect, a a highly significant, you know, statistically significant effect was on the impact on this third factor, adult students' respect and relationships was the area that we've seen the greatest change in the schools that we've been working in when they work on this process. So I guess I want to show you how I think that that sort of comes about. You have a handout that's called this respect continuum uh, yes. that we that, mm-hmm. that we referred to, mm-hmm. and this is a this I actually have this really close friend who's a superintendent. He was a superintendent in the first school district that we did this work in, and Melissa, I'll tell you that it was just like the project you're doing with Dr. Taylor. Uh, we had an educational psychology class. We were looking at schools and school issues, and we went into this high school down the road um, near New England College, and we we went in and we interviewed students. My, my ed psych students did, and they said, so of all the things that kind of prohibit you from learning or get in the way of your learning, what are the things that sort of are the biggest impediments to you, that if we could remove those barriers, you'd be more successful? And almost, you know, exclusively, the students all chimed in and said, it's the issue of respect. There's no respect in this school, and that's what gets in the way. And so we thought that was interesting. We wrote that up, and we went then in the next afternoon, we talked to all the teachers. And same kind of question. What's the thing that kind of gets in the way of you being an effective teacher in this school? And what do you think they said? Respect. They said, Mm -hmm. there's just no respect around here. Oh, yeah. And so they had this consensus about Mm -hmm. what the issue was at this school. Of course, when we unpacked that with the teachers and the students, they meant really, really different things. And so we said, well, everybody's using this word respect as the issue, but the teachers mean one thing and the kids mean something else. So how can we ever resolve this without coming to some consensus about what the meaning of respect is? So it prompted us to do what we thought was one of our more fun research projects. And that was we went back to that school. We selected a really diverse group of students from those different table groups. We actually showed them little theater sketches on respect and disrespect issues in the school, gave them a little piece of paper, and we said, when you're watching this little skit, why don't you just kind of note the words that you hear, the actions that you see, that either look respectful to you or that look disrespectful to you. And then we looked at what kids wrote up, and we were able to actually see that the kids actually all identified the respect issues as respect issues and the disrespect issues as the disrespect issues. So we said, okay, I think you're ready to go now out into your school. We're going to give you these pagers. Like, remember the old days when doctors carried pagers around? It wasn't that long ago. Mm-hmm. And, and we set them on vibrate so nobody could hear them. They were like secret agents out there wandering around the school with their pagers in their pockets. And we had their bell schedule back at New England College. And we knew when they were in the hallways and when they were in their classrooms and on the playground and on the bus. And we beeped those 30 pagers. And that meant Pay attention. Listen, watch for examples of respect or disrespect over the next 10 minutes. And 10 minutes later, we beeped them again, and they pulled out those little self-report forms, and they just wrote down what did they see, what did they hear, what did adults do, what did kids do that looked respectful or disrespectful in their school. And we didn't just have students. We had teachers do this, and the school resource officer did it. 
And after a week, six to eight times a day, 30 people being paged at a shot, we'd collected about 1,200 real-time snapshots or samples of respect and disrespect in that school. And what we came up with when I sat down in my PJs that weekend and sort of went through all those 1,200 sheets were these issues. There was a very, very small pile, so I'm now looking at this respect continuum if you have that handout. There was a very small pile of incidents of violence, but not very many, like two in a week. A kid got thrown up against the locker, another kid got punched. Uh, there were more threats. There were kids saying, I'm going to get you, but no evidence that it happened, but the threats were there. And then there were all the things that we refer to as kind of verbal harassment or bullying, verbal bullying and stuff, you know, prejudicial, racist or um, derogatory comments about different groups of people, etc. And then there was a bunch of um, examples of people who are breaking rules, you know, uh, either adults breaking rules that kids pointed out or, or students breaking rules. So that was what the disrespect looked like with the main pile being under harassment, under bullying and harassment, verbal harassment. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom of the respect continuum was what really caught our eye, though, that kids were actually able and the teachers were able to identify examples of respect, but there were far, far fewer examples that were positive of respect than there were negative. The first one was compliance. Kids said, yeah, in this school, the teacher says, sit down and be quiet in this class, and kids do. And we think that's important. And I taught seventh grade. I know if your kids won't sit down and be quiet when you tell them to, you can't do much teaching. But the problem that we found is that a lot of schools stop right there, that that's what they say is respectful, is compliance. And that creates a certain kind of environment in a school when respect is all about the kids doing what they're told. The other uh, piles of things that we saw that were respectful, the next one was engagement. That students said, I think it's respectful in this class because the teacher does activities with us that we find interesting. We do projects. We, we get to go outside once in a while and do things that are engaging to us. And I look forward to coming to this class. That's respectful. Um, the other one was about relationships. And this was a fairly large school. And the kid said, I can tell you right now that these, this teacher knows my name. She knows things about my family. Uh, she knows things about me, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. I think that relationship is respectful. A few kids, not a whole lot, but a few kids said, there's a teacher in this school that actually not only does she know us, but she changes the way she teaches depending upon who we are. And that's respectful. She, she literally offers different options for different kinds of kids. And, and what we read into that was teachers were addressing learning styles and interests and things like that that we call differentiation of instruction. And the last one, which, again, is the basis for our whole project, and this is where we really kind of came down on empowerment as our model, um, there was a particular girl we beeped. Uh, she was a senior, and we, she was in uh, a classroom when we beeped her, and she wrote on her sheet, I think it's respectful because we just did our final exam, and the teacher allowed us to uh, choose from all the poetry we've been studying for this poetry unit um, a genre that we like, and she allowed us to create an original piece of po poetry using that genre as evidence of our learning of, of this, the subjects of poetry. And she said, I think that's respectful because she didn't give us a fill-in-the-blank kind of test or something. She let us use what she taught us. The next day, we beeped that girl in the same classroom, and she said, this is really respectful. The teacher took our tests, our, our poems. She went to Kinko's last night, and she bound them in a leather book. She published our work in a book, and I think that's respectful. Now I feel like a, an author. Next day, we beeped her, and she said, we're actually in the middle school now, and we're... Um, we're actually reading our poems to the middle school kids, and we beeped her again about an hour and a half later. And she said, yeah, now I'm in the library, and they're putting one of those little sticky things in the back of our book because the kids want to take our book home and read poetry from our book to their brothers and sisters and parents. She said, I think that's very respectful because I feel like a published author. Mm -hmm. So the empowerment of kids in the classroom or the empowerment of students, and, and I guess I will just try to maybe wrap up with this thought, there's a there's a book called The Predictable Failure of Educational Reform. <laughs> it's a pretty uplifting title. Um, but Seymour Saracen talks about that in all of the research he did over 40 years on school reform initiatives, the one thing that he could look to that would predict success, successful increase in academic performance, was when there was a shift in power relations in the initiative. 
So instead of the superintendent telling the principals what they had to do and the principals telling the teachers what they had to do, the superintendent would ask the principals to get together and make some decisions about what was important for their school. The principals would meet with the teachers and plan together with them. And so empowerment seemed to be what Saracen showed as one of the key factors in successful reform. And I think we all know that. We, nobody likes to be told what to do. So I, I think our whole program is built around empowering these kids, and I see how, how effective it can be. So that's the respect continuum. It's, it's a little bit of a long story, but teachers in schools have used that then to create action projects that um, we think are really powerful. Uh, and, and some of the ones that Melissa talked about are, are, are examples of empowerment. I think that could be a wonderful tool, and um, and one thing I just want to interject here, because I know you are involved in teacher preparation, does this whole concept of respect and disrespect and empowerment of students in that process, uh, something that is reflected in classes that are taught, certainly at your school and elsewhere? Well, we certainly know a lot of the research on, you know, brain-based learning and mm-hmm. constructivist pedagogy and all of those kinds of things um, are really all about engagement and uh, active involvement in learning. Um, if you ask students who their best teachers were, they'll always tell you the ones that did kind of hands-on projects and activities that were engaging to them and interesting to them. I want to show you a slide that says, um, now that is a respectful school on mm-hmm. top of it. Um, and this is some evidence of the fact that those pedagogical strategies really do work and change schools. The column on the left is the average high school uh, result. If you take all the high schools we've been in the country, which is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50, um, those are their average scores on those questions. Uh, notice where it says students help make decisions about school rules and discipline. That's one of the real empowerment questions. Twelve percent of the students agreed with that in, on average in the schools. That's always the lowest number wherever we go. But look at the school on the right. That is a school in Vermont. It's called the Compass School. It's a very small little, little independent school. You know, they're not a typical high school. But notice the difference in the two sets of data. When we go into schools and they say, well, you know, that's just the way school is. You know, you don't, you don't get to share decision making. You don't get to empower kids very much. That's not the way schools work. But we say, well, how come this school gets to do these things and look at what the climate looks like there? And you talk, Terry, about professional development. One of the most powerful pieces of professional development that we do is we bring teachers to schools that are actually doing this work and see that on the ground things can actually look quite different than what we do and they they actually can partner then with those schools and have those teachers come and you know, share their work with the other schools so that's what we do at the teen summits where the students share their work with other teams we do professional development conferences we have one coming up at the end of june where teachers will come and schools will come and share their work with one another and we think that's again a very kind of empowering approach to the professional development um I guess the only other thing I wanted to try to get to, and I know we're probably running out of time, is where we're headed. Oh, yeah. Uh, if, if you click down, you'll mm-hmm. see a slide that says the U.S. Department of Education School Climate Improvement. Kevin Jennings is now the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education for Safe and Drug-Free Schools. And most of you that have worked on school climate have used Safe and Drug-Free School dollars for uh, anti-bullying programs, anti-violence programs, etc. Those monies are gone. Uh, there's no more money out there for Safe and Drug-Free Schools. They're just spending the money that's left over in that account. Uh, but next year, there will be, I think it's $300 million is the first take, where schools are going to be allowed to apply for grants to support school climate improvement initiatives. The only criteria that I've seen so far that Kevin Jennings is offering is, number one, schools that apply need to collect data based on national standards. They have to show where they are in relation to those national standards. And the other main piece is that they have to uh, show that the work that they're doing is going to be particularly effective for the lowest performing kids in their school. Um, so that the the whole model that we talked about of a diverse team, of targeting college-bound, non-college-bound kids, et cetera, they want to see that disaggregation of data and make sure that this is targeted to the neediest kids as well. So I think that's very hopeful that there's a mm-hmm. whole division of the U.S. Department of Ed now that's turning its attention to school climate as one of the key variables for school improvement. We're very excited about that. Oh, I know you've got to be. Um, and to our listeners, the uh, standards that were given earlier during the broadcast and are a part of the PowerPoint, these would be the ones that uh, would be uh, used 
or is there something? Well, is this still evolving? It's evolving. And again, uh, there, there are probably several groups of people that are working on these standards right now, but mm-hmm. uh, the ones that we shared are kind of our version of Jonathan Cohen's and Terry Pickrell's standards. Mm-hmm. We, we were actually kind of feeling that they were a little academic, so we translated them into English with, with their permission. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but actually, they actually have a wonderful project where they have a student leadership team working nationally uh, together uh, via the web to really do a student translation of their national ah, standards. So they're, it's that great. one will be understood. I know it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, three, three students from New Hampshire are part of that group Terrific. that were t- yeah. members of our group. So mm. very exciting that they're modeling the whole idea of civic engagement and empowering kids to be part of that national movement. So we're not sure which standards will be the final mm-hmm. adopted standards. But when you look at them, what I like is their common sense. Yeah. And so my guess is it's going to be pretty hard to stray too far from those standards. So schools that want to be eligible uh, for the funding just need to start to say, you know, we're not just doing bullying work or we're not just doing mm-hmm. violence prevention work. Yes. We're actually working on the bigger picture of school climate, which has to do with relationships and mm-hmm. personalization in the school and, uh, and engaged learning and probably the kind of infrastructure, a safe and kind of welcoming environment in a school so I, I think it's an exciting time. Yes, and I think um, people will stay tuned to um, your website and the National School Climate Center website and to keep abreast of what's going on here and have the resources so they can move forward in this really important area. Uh, thank you. I see uh, the last slide has contact information for you. Do you mind people writing to you, Bill? Oh, no, I like it. Okay, good. <laughs> no, please, in, uh, in our office, uh, you can call or email, and uh, we have a, a wonderful staff of uh, New England College students, like Melissa is going to work with us next year, we okay. hope. And uh, uh, it's a great uh, learning opportunity for them, and they love to talk to people, so give them a call. That's terrific. Well, uh, Bill, this has really been a very interesting program, and, and unfortunately, we're, we're at the end, and we have to end this uh, so quickly, but uh, we've certainly had a very, very valuable hour plus learning more about the school climate and how to improve. Uh, this important uh, area of school reform. I think working in this area couldn't be more important as we all strive to enable all students to feel safe, engaged in learning, and better prepared for life after high school. And I want to thank you personally for I really appreciate your taking the time uh, and effort to be with our uh, with us today and share your work and your research with our listeners. Uh, Marty, um, Yeah, I've got to agree, and and I'm so glad we had Melissa with us as well. Uh, I think the youth voice is is so powerful. Not that you weren't, Bill, but I think (laughs) Melissa was a good addition to the program, and we thank you both for being here. I always learn so much with these programs, and this is my new soapbox, Terry. It's going to be school climate. You just People are going to be so tired of hearing me. No, they're not. They're going to be excited about hearing this because this is a great dropout prevention strategy. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Well, we need to remind our listeners that this radio webcast, like all our monthly programs, will be archived on our website within the next two hours. And it'll be downloadable for your iPod or your MP3 player, so you can go back and listen again and recommend the program to your friends and colleagues who couldn't tune in live. And so this archive program has been used over and over. Terry, we hear about it all the time uh, for professional development activities. Put those slides up on the screen, put the speakers on the computer, and you've got a tremendous introduction to school climate for your faculty or your community group and parents and students. Students should be listening to this one. Just give them an opportunity to hear about what they can do to change things in their schools. So I love also that we're on iTunes, you know, and so you can subscribe to Solutions and have it free uh, every month. Well, it certainly is a great resource, Marty. And uh, in May, our guest will be Dr. Maria Kuka Monticelli, who is president of the International Development Research Association, or IDRA, who will tell us about their award-winning cross-age tutoring pro- uh, program called the Coca-Cola Valued Youth Program. And this is a highly researched and highly respected program. Um, and uh, it, this program will, um, it will air on Tuesday, May the 11th, at 3:30 Eastern Time. We do hope that you'll that you'll join that. That, uh, that program. Well, uh, thanks to all of you for listening and participating. Remember that we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research-based solutions, we can assure that all of our students graduate. 
Join us next time for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. 